Welcome to the Great Connections Podcast. We're your hosts, Marcia Famolero Enright and Liz Parker. In this podcast, we aim to talk about powerful ideas and practices that will aid you in achieving the best for your life and living as a free person, like the ones we use at the Great Connections Seminars. Visit thegreatconnections.org for more information on our in-person programs and where you can subscribe and comment on the podcast, find links and resources, as well as our email address. We'd love to hear from you. Today, we're going to be talking about how each person constructs his or her own mind, whether they know it or not. This is what we call the art of self-construction. You know, most people don't realize that ideas, especially philosophy, affect them very much in everyday life. And to be in control of your own mind and choices, you need to know what those ideas are. Well, I don't know if most people are interested in philosophical ideas. Um, From my experience, I think most people are just living their lives and they have their hobbies, the things that they're interested in. But philosophy just seems to be an outdated thing that people don't really think about. Well, that doesn't mean they aren't influenced by it, particularly ethics. You know, for example, what if your boss is doing something shady at work? How do you decide what to do? What's right and wrong? Uh, should you should you act in your own self-interest? Well, what is your self-interest in the long term or the short term? You know, there's an there's something that happened to me where I found myself in a shady situation at work and it was that same question of, well, what do I do? And I remember talking to you about it because I had this big moral conflict and you had said something about golden handcuffs keeping me there when everything else, like my ethics and, you know, my conscience was telling me, no, this isn't right and this is not making you feel good. It makes it stressful to go to work and you're having all this inner turmoil, but you know, the golden handcuffs were keeping me there, but it was really difficult to know, well, should I stay or what should I do? Because you don't want to get other people in trouble. You don't want to, you know, hurt a mission. And yeah, there were a lot of questions that it was really difficult to know how to choose what to do. Right, because, I mean, what I meant by golden handcuffs was that they were paying you well. And so it seemed like in your short-term self-interest, the thing to do was to go along with what was uh, you didn't think was right in order to keep getting your salary. But then you were finding out that you had all of these long-term consequences where you were really unhappy with the situation. It was making you not like uh, your whole life, you know. And that can happen with family dynamics, too. Yeah, with family dynamics, I think that's especially difficult because knowing what's right and what's wrong is so embedded in, you know, your family relationships and history and how it's formed you. And there's a lot of sense. I I come from a Korean-American family, so there's a lot of sense of duty when it comes to the family. And so there's this turmoil of like, should I sacrifice my dreams and my life for my family? Should I do this for my family and, you know, sacrifice everything that I wanted to do to make sure they're okay. And it makes those decisions really difficult to know what to do because kind of like what you were saying with the golden handcuffs in my short term self-interest, you know, it's better for me to placate my family and make sure my family dynamics at home are not stressful. But then in the long term, am I giving up my dreams? Am I setting myself up for a future where I'm not entirely happy? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult to know. And yet these are all ethical questions, you know, and we can either ignore, we can ignore these problems or we can solve them. You know, if you ignore them, what happens is sometimes people ignore them because they're very busy with their projects or, or or their work or what they're doing. And then suddenly in middle age, they find themselves in a huge mental crisis because they don't know what they're doing. And you said earlier that 
ideas influence us everywhere. So in situations like these where you're at work and you're confronted with this ethical situation or you're in a family dynamic where you feel like you're losing yourself, what do you do and how do you even become aware of that and how are these influencing us every day? Well, the the main thing that you want to do is start to be aware of all of the philosophical issues around you. And it's interesting because there's a lot of philosophical catchphrases in our culture that people don't even realize um, have tremendous implications uh, for ethics, for knowledge, for society. They just don't recognize them as such. And four, four that that I mean, three that come to mind right away to me is it's true for you, but not for me, or you have to protect the earth, or you need to give back. You know, have you heard people mentioning any of these? Yeah, I actually had an experience with a coworker about um, the it's true for you, but not for me statement. Um, he said it a little bit differently. He said, well, that's your perspective. That's not my perspective. So you know, what can we do? And we had gotten into a conversation about healthcare, care. Um, and he had mentioned, oh, well, you know, I think it's a moral right for everybody to have health care. And I, at that time, didn't have any health care. So, and it was a big issue for me because of, you know, the current policies about being forced to get health care or being penalized if you don't have health care. And so we talked about, well, what is a moral right? And that's where we got into a conflict. And we had talked at length about it. And in the end, after all this discussion, he just told me, well, that's what you think. That's not what I think. And I was just left feeling like our whole conversation meant nothing because nobody can be right. Or I'm right and he's right. And we're both right. So then nothing is really right in the end. So it was really unsatisfying to have been told, oh, well, that's for, true for you, but it's not true for me. And that has tremendous long-term effects on people because if there is no right or wrong, then what's the point of what you're doing? You know, and, and that just pulls the meaning out of things. You know, people don't realize it, but each of us has to construct our own self and our own minds and our own characters. I don't know if you've noticed, but you'll often find adolescents suddenly starting to argue about the existence of God. And that's the indication that there's this tremendous biological development going on when you go through puberty, where you're going from talking about, uh, from being able to deal with simple ideas to being able to deal with very abstract ideas. And the fact of the matter is that the human mind is ruled by ideas. Thinking is basically, basically reasoning with ideas. So much of your character and yourself is unformed, but you have a lot of ideological baggage that you pick up from childhood when you, you, you're not able to think abstractly, so you're not able to examine it. But after you go through puberty, you have um, a whole new layer of cortex develops in the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes. And the interesting thing is the frontal lobes especially are the ones where all your information comes together and you make decisions. So you'll notice that adolescents are very insistent on making their own decisions. And really what they're doing is they're practicing with their new brain. So this is happening while you're going through adolescence, but you've picked up ideas from your childhood, the way your family runs. Like you said, for example, your family was very duty-oriented. That's something that um, you, you get just by breathing practically in your family while you're little. And you, when you go through adolescence, however, you suddenly are able to think about those things in a conscious way. And if you want to be autonomous, and if you want to live as a free person, you need to be your own director. You have to get control of your mind and its contents. You have to examine it. Well, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say we pick up all these ideas, kind of like this ideological baggage from our childhood? How do you really get in control of your mind? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. On what basis do you make choices about your friends, 
the activities you're going to do, the parties you're going to go to, whether you're going to take drugs or not, or your aims for the future. I, I mean, how are you deciding that? Well, if you haven't thought about it consciously, then you're making those decisions based on whatever ideas that you got from your family. For example, oh, drugs are horribly bad. I, I, I remember having um, being an instructor at a camp one time where we talked about ideas, and uh, we had a game where I put up various phrases and then the kids had to argue what, uh, whether it was true or not. So one of the phrases I put up was, drugs are bad. And what was interesting about that was, of course, right away the kids said, oh yeah, they're bad. But then I brought up aspirin, I brought up um, the drugs for diabetes, I, and all the the medicines that people take to make them well. And suddenly the kids realized that they had this um, idea about drugs in their mind that wasn't really accurate. So that's the kind of example of where you you have things in your mind and you need to take control of them. You need to be more aware of them. I mean, when you were talking about on what basis do we choose our friends and, you know, what activities we do or partying, I think about when I was in my early 20s. I'm in my late 20s now, but I remember when I had graduated college and I was I still had friends from high school who I was connected to, and I just found myself going along with things they enjoyed. So we would go out to clubs, we would go drinking, and I remember always having a horrible time. Like, it was never enjoyable to me. I don't enjoy going out and paying for a cocktail and being in a loud club. It's just not my idea of fun, but I had always thought, well, this is what we do. This is what fun is. And I really had to reevaluate my friendships because if all we're doing is going out to clubs and I'm not having a good time, on what basis am I choosing these friends? And why am I even going to these places and doing these things? Exactly. What kind of life do I want? I mean, there's all those questions you, you have to ask yourself. You know, so the, the brain develops this new cortex when you're about 13 or 14, but later... You start, you're able to start, when you're 16 or 17, you're able to start thinking more self-consciously about ideas and values. But your brain still isn't fully developed until you're about 24. And yet, when you're thinking about, you're, now you're able to think about these abstract ideas and you're paying more attention to them, they're coming at you from all areas of the culture. And uh, you might be aware, for example, about the current issue of veganism or eating organic food. And the way people react, you know, as if it's a religious issue. You know, you have to eat organic instead of it being a scientific issue. There's, it seems to me there's a lot of social pressure around the issue of eating organic food. And it's not based on fact. Uh, and yet, what happens? You kind of take it on unconsciously. Oh, yeah. I definitely feel that I even fell into this where I'm like, oh, it's organic. It's good. Um, even though afterwards I would come across articles that show that the scientific evidence for it is really ambiguous or really not in favor of organic food being superior in any way. Um, and I, but there is this tremendous social pressure around it that, you know, it has to be organic if it's good. And, um, even around recycling when, you know, I have, guests over, friends over at the house. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, do you recycle? It's like automatically this judgment that's made about you when even then, you know, our recycling system is kind of horrible and most of it just ends up going into the dump anyways. But there's still this social pressure that persists. And it, yeah, it's funny that you say that. It's like we have all this scientific evidence or articles or information that show one thing, yet Socially, we continue to enforce this um, code that is otherwise. Exactly. You know, and here's a related example. Protect the earth. There's a huge amount of social pressure with almost religious connotations around the idea that we have to protect the earth. But when you look at it, it's a spider web of unexamined ideas and influence, you know. Oh, yeah. I j was watching this comedy show the other day and the comedian actually said something related to this he said humans are the number one crappy thing on this planet 
And he was saying this because we destroy the environment and we make animals go extinct. And, you know, the audience was laughing and yeah, humans are so crappy. Look at what we do. We just mess everything up. But I, I felt kind of conflicted about it because in the end, it was kind of like he was saying, well, humans are worthless. And, you know, all this life and like these beautiful environments that we've built are inherently bad because, you know, they mar the purity of the earth. And so if humans are so bad, the logical thing would be to just wipe everyone out, right? Like humans suck and the earth is perfect. So, you know, we're the number one crappy thing. Let's just get rid of us. Exactly. And there's even an organization for that called the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. Oh my gosh, that's just absurd. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a big contradiction on how we treat human life. Because in one sense, it's that we want to protect everyone's quality of life, right? Like access to clean drinking water or, you know, quality health care. But then at the same time, when people make comments like that about like, oh, humans are the number one crappy thing on the planet, it's kind of like human la life is degraded to be below that of the natural environment. Exactly. I mean, I think this reminds me of the whole issue surrounding DDT and malaria where, we, you know, DDT was banned even though a million people die every year from malaria. So it's something that is very preventable. It's DDT is something that is very effective and it's been proven to save human lives. And at the same time, we're sacrificing these humans in pursuit of saving an environmental life where it's even then the evidence for that is not really clear. Well, you know, it's like the earth and everything else has an intrinsic value. Uh, and the first question to ask is, why? You know, as if it's valuable in itself, apart from its value to human beings. But you have to ask yourself, why? And what, what is the source of value? How do you decide that the earth is valuable in itself? You have to ask, what's the source of value? And really, when you look at it, human life and what's to the extent that something is important to humans and the lives of other living beings and the condition of the environment in which we live, that's what's in, what makes it valuable, right? Because only living things have values. They, they, they're the only things that need stuff to stay alive. And the earth itself isn't a living thing, although many things on it are. And all together, we comprise the environment. But it's not like we're really one united group of things. It's not that we are a living organism in itself. So the earth itself doesn't have intrinsic value, although there is a reason. So there's no reason to protect it apart from protecting the living things that are on it and those other things in the environment that that support living things, right? It, 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 it just exists. It's not an end in itself. It's only a means to maintain our lives and the, and the qualities about the environment that keep us alive and the other living beings that are valuable to us. So, but the radical environmentalists, they've turned this on its head. And like you said, they put human life below the environment in terms of value. And they also say that human life is equal or less than the lives of other living things. And so one of their arguments to protect the environment is that you have to protect the snail darter or the spotted owl at the expense of a human being, you know. So what basis do they make this claim on? Now, I'm not talking about people who just want clean air, clean water, and sensible uh, environmentalists. I'm talking about the radical environmentalists, the ones that want to get rid of technology and they um, don't they really dislike most things that human beings are doing. So what's the basis of their argument? What's their, what's their argument that the earth or other living things should have a greater value than human life and flourishing? You know, so to, to argue that, you have to explain why do we have the concept of value and how does that concept arise? And what they do is in their arguments, they appeal to the common sense idea that we should protect the environment for our own sake. So they kind of appeal to people that way, but then they slip in this other premise that the earth is intrinsically good apart from human life. 
if the earth is an intrinsic good and humans are, quote, destroying it, then humans are bad. But what does destroying mean? On, what ba on the basis of what standard? That it's being changed? Why is that a standard? You know, it's amazing to me that in nature there is change all the time that we have nothing to do with. Why should and, and and it's part of being alive or it's a part of geological processes. There's constant change. So why should staying the same be good? And in fact, if you look at human beings and or anything alive, change is a constant. We're growing, we're developing, we're learning new things, we're um, up, we're creating new uh, work. And I even other animals, there's change all the time. You know they they. Uh, start out as small, they grow, they develop, they have families, the, the next generation comes along. That's that's a essence of human life. But it seems like the radical environmentalists want everything to stay exactly the same. And think about it. it. It means that those people are amazingly conservative, which is ironic because they're often associated with the left, which has always been considered very radical and for uh, things to be different, right? Well, in fact, they are terrible conservatives. They want to keep everything the same. They don't want people to change their jobs. They don't want to change the way the environment is or the forest or the ocean. They want everything the same. They don't like change. They don't like science, technology, or dynamic markets. They're a bunch of medievalists. And the rapid change of the markets and of capitalism scares them tremendously. What you're saying is, kind of exactly the way I felt when I heard that was, yeah, it's like humans have no meaning on this planet and it's really depressing and all the amazing things that we've done in terms of science and technology and even medicine and improving lives, it's all worthless when it comes to the environment. So it's, I like how you explain that catchphrase that we need to protect the earth because it shows that within that one catchphrase, there's all this logic and philosophical thinking that shows that, well, human life is not that important. But on the surface, that protect the earth catchphrase appears really harmless and actually like something that is really positive. Right, because it, it appeals to people's natural sense that, well, we should have clean air and clean water and have things be orderly and protect um, valuable plants and animals. You know, it appeals to kind of a common sense sense of environmentalism. But you dig down deeper and you find out it's, there's much more than that. And so I'm interested in hearing more about what you think about that give back catchphrase. I know you had mentioned that this is also another catchphrase that we hear often. And given that all these values and premises are contained within that protect the earth catchphrase, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, that, that one can really get me going. Um, and I'll tell you why later. But it, the, the idea that you need to give back is based on, well, just to be clear to any listeners that don't know, it means that you are supposed to um, find ways to take your money and time and effort to help other people and, 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 and the society. And it's based on the idea that you're born into an advanced and privileged society and you owe a debt to those that created it. You know, that, that um, you, you, didn't, you didn't get here, you didn't get your iPhone on your own. Um, so you really, if you achieve anything, if you make a new idea, a new technology, or create a new organization, well, it's based on all of the things that went, all the ideas, the research, the work that went before you. And so you owe, you have a kind of debt uh, to those people, the, the people that created the society that we have. But the thing is, when I think about what I do and almost anything that um, I have been able, I have enjoyed of that privilege. It's all due to people that are dead, to my grandparents that came over here from the old country, and so I'm lucky enough to live in the United States. It's to my parents that sent me to good schools, that encouraged me to learn music, philosophy, psychology, everything. Um, they're all dead. So who am I supposed to, to give back to, right? Uh, not Not... Not the people that are my contemporaries. They're not the ones that especially helped me be where I am. 
I mean, those who are, I am very grateful to them, but most of them aren't. So socially, it's it's like impossible to give back to the people who I actually um, uh, owe something to. But the phrase itself kind of implies that you do owe something, and so it, it implies that you have an unearned guilt, that if you don't give back, there's something wrong with you. Uh, but it's almost impossible to give back for what you actually owe, right? Because those people are dead. Guilt is should be about for what you actually did wrong, what you actually owe, what is deserved, not what you haven't earned, not the un, not unearned. The pro, the thing is that guilt makes people develop a lack of confidence. They when they feel guilty, they don't have confidence in their judgments and their actions. And so they're more easily swayed by others. They're controlled by others. And that's the purpose of unearned guilt. If if I tell you, you need to give back, and it makes you feel, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't deserve what I have. You know, I, I, I need to uh, give to other people because of it. But that's not really true. Who are you supposed to give to? You don't really owe anything to the guy on the street, but, but it makes you feel guilty then it kind of undermines your own judgment and your actions and what you're doing. Am I doing the right thing? Am I living the right way? <clears throat> Should I be allowed to keep the money that I've earned or not? And, and that guilt, that lack of confidence, makes you more easily swayed by others and controlled by others because it, it undermines your self-confidence. And that's the purpose of unearned, unearned guilt, is to control you. People who feel good about themselves, who feel morally right, they aren't easy to control. But the collectivists, the ones that want, that believe that you shouldn't be, um, that you owe something to everybody else and you all, always should be concerned about everybody else, they want to control. They want power to make people do what they want. They're afraid of autonomy and they're afraid of independence. The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was highly aware of this and he wrote about it in the Genealogy of Morals. He wrote about the concept of original sin as a way of causing unearned guilt in people because you're born as a baby and you automatically have sin. You've done nothing but you automatically have sin. So that gives you guilt and then you are not very certain and it allows you to be controlled through power. When I heard the concept of unearned guilt, it first really shook me because it resonated so much with my experience, um, especially with family that, you know, even if your family is terrible to you or, you know, the society that you're in is terrible to you, you still owe who you are to them. And it's kind of like, well, you didn't play any role into your own being or becoming the person that you are. And so you're forever indebted to them. And yeah, it was always something that, it was something that I had a lot when I was growing up. And you're right, it undermines your confidence and you become so uncertain because then you feel guilty for, you know, having dreams or having ambitions of your own. You know, that it becomes a big source of guilt and then you feel bad to pursue those things, even though they're great things. Exactly. That's why I'm I'm very I'm very sensitive to any any implication of unearned guilt because of that. Well, it also implies that like what you've earned has come at the expense of others. So anything that you've done on your own, you know, it's not really yours. That's not that's not really an empowering way to live. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I have a friend who I think takes these kinds of ideas really seriously. And I think this kind of uncertainty and undermining of confidence, I think he exhibits this in not just like how he carries himself, but more in like the artistic things that he's drawn to. Like I know, for instance, he was really drawn to the sculptures of Giacometti, which kind of have this like existentialist and tragic air about them. And I think it is all tied in with this idea of unearned guilt, of uncertainty, and trying to define yourself and your life and your identity in a culture where everything's kind of prone to despair or says that your life is meaningless. 
or that like anything goes because if you have this unearned guilt and you're not really confident in yourself and your dreams like what does that do to your ambition and how does that end up changing your life you you're right on liz and you know <clears throat> this comes out i think in in our popular uh culture and art and artistic choices especially in things like film because i think one of the implicit ideas in our culture is that in part of our culture is that real heroes aren't possible you know, when you think about it, when was the last time you saw a real contemporary hero, a person of great moral character and great integrity, performing deeds of courage? You know, you, you might see them in like action dramas like Jack Reacher or the Bourne movies. <clears throat> but even there, the, the, the heroes are often really conflicted and they're unhappy and they're not sure of whether what they're doing is right. Um, the most recent movie I saw where you had a real hero who was unconflicted, who had integrity, who had tremendous courage was Bridge of Spies. And that was about uh, Jack Donahue, who was a, a lawyer in the, in the, um, at Nuremberg. And then he was a defense lawyer for a Russian spy here in the United States. And he eventually was involved in the swap between the Russian spy and uh, Gary Powers, who got shot down over the Soviet Union. But that's all a story from the 50s and the 60s. You know, it's like, oh, okay, there was a real hero that long time ago, but is, do we have any contemporary ones? <clears throat> you know, um, what do we get in great supply instead? It, it's superheroes, right? Or sci-fi heroes. You know, it's heroes like Thor or Captain America, and even in Captain America, his sensibilities are from the 40s, or Star Trek's Captain uh, Jim Kirk. And when I look at that, I think to myself, hmm, I wonder why. You know, if you look at Iron Man, he's a kind of, he's like a quasi-superhero. He's not a superhero in the sense of having a supernatural power. He's somebody who has um, tremendous intelligence and ability and has created great technological power. <clears throat> but they even show him as having loads of inner turmoil and conflict, right? So why is it that we can't see any real heroes in the movies, but we see superheroes? And I think that's because the values and the ideas and what um, you could call postmodern or postmodern culture imply that real heroes can't exist. And what really disturbs me about that is that attitude, and, and you kind of touched on it, that attitude towards heroes hits at the deepest needs of the young. Because the young are desperate for role models of real people who have achieved something in life, who've, who've been able to live a happy life and um, done great things. You know, when you're young, you have your whole life ahead of you, and you want to do something valuable with it. How do you figure that out? Who are your examples? You know, it, it, and when but when you have a culture that shows you, oh, well, it's only superheroes that can do great things and they have that integrity. What does that tell you about what you can do with your actual life? I like what you said about how it this attitude toward heroes hits at the deepest needs of the young, and I think maybe even the needs of all people that like of all ages, because we want life to have a meaning, so we're searching for something with a meaning. And it's kind of like with my example with my friend is that he was so distressed and despairing because he saw that there really was no meaning in life. And I think you're right. This attitude towards superheroes or heroes in general is that, yes, life has a meaning and we have a purpose and we can do it. In terms of finding meaning in life, I feel like in those parts of my life when I was searching for meaning were really the most difficult to live through. I remember after going to school, I found a job in my field for what I had studied for. And, you know, I would still wake up every morning hating going to work. That was my worst part of my day. It, every morning just to get up was a big ordeal. And I lived with this kind of unexplainable malaise with life. There was this big hopelessness and despair, kind of like what my friend is living through. 
but I felt like I did everything right. You know, I did well in school. I got a job in my field and I'm doing everything I should be doing. So why aren't I happy? And so it feels like I'm doing something wrong, but really I'm just living on autopilot and feeling really uncertain about life. And I think it's kind of what you were talking about earlier about carrying all this ideological baggage with you. You know, I was really drawn to, you know, movies where they're filled with despair. I, it just kind of fed into this. I read books where the characters, you know, fed into this hopelessness of life. And um, I read a lot of the existentialist novels and philosophers because you know, that's what I was feeling at the time. But it was really, it really made me unhappy. And I think it only really began to change when, when you're right, when you begin to examine the ideological baggage that you have and say, well, where did this come from? And what do I really want? And why do I want it? Yeah, and whether those ideas are right. I mean, are, the, are those ideas that things are meaningless and that uh, you can't know right or wrong and you can't know anything for sure or we all disagree, are they true? I mean, one of the things that's ironic to me is those comments are always made with such certainty. I'd like to know how they're certain since they're telling you that you can't know anything for sure. Exactly. And even, you know, the sense of duty to your family or, you know, to your community and your society. I mean, yeah, why, where does that come from? And, you know, we see that it has tremendous effect on how we think about ourselves and how we live our lives. So I feel like when I started to really question it, I was surprised by how much I was influenced without even knowing it. Yeah, I think when you grow up, you, there's, you have a whole hodgepodge of ideas. And part of the typical anxiety of the young is that they, they're um, wending their way through trying to figure out what's Right, what to do with their life and what ideas to base them on, whether they even know it or not. So if these ideas are all around us and we're being influenced by them, how then do we really get in control of them? And how can you really start to begin to construct your own life and your own self? Well, you know, unfortunately, we're running out of time right now. So we're going to talk about that in the next episode, which is called Thinking in Principle. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to your comments and questions. Please check out our webpage at www.thegreatconnections.org podcast, where you can also learn more about the Great Connections weekend and week-long in-person seminars. Until next time, live free.